Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Psalm 23 and also John chapter 10. Psalm 23 and John chapter 10. David is reminiscing. He's looking back over his life lived under the tender care of his shepherd, the Lord. Now what is interesting is how this psalm flows. It begins with David sounding the note of the security of his soul. That is priority number one. We like to sing that hymn, It is well with my soul. I hope it is. Uh, Everything else in your life can be going awesome. Uh, But if you cannot say it is well with my soul, you've got a problem. But David begins right here, the security of his soul. Uh, Then as the psalm progresses, he begins to share with us the memories of his mind. He's looking back on his life and all that the Lord had meant to him and all that the Lord had done for him. So he goes down memory lane. So... Sounding the note of the security of his soul. Moving on to the memories of his mind. How will he close out? I love this. He closes out with the hope of his heart. Because he could say, the Lord is my shepherd. He could wind it up by saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There are a lot of people who want to dwell in the house of the Lord, but they just don't want him as their shepherd. It doesn't work that way, people. And so as he sounds these three great notes of victory, he looks back on his life and he considers his faith journey. It starts out in infancy. We're going to see that. And then from infancy, it's going to go to adolescence. And and when we get into uh, how he describes for us the adolescence of his faith journey, he's going to mark out two things. Young people, listen to me. You'll need two things if you're going to succeed in life. You're going to need direction and you're going to need discipline. There's a way that seems right unto a child, but the ways thereof are the ways of destruction. And you would think that some grown-ups would learn that as well, but they don't. So he will reminisce his days of infancy, how God sheltered him, sustained him. And then moving on into adolescence, how God had to direct him and even discipline him. And then he moves on into maturity. There's a settledness. There's a growth. And then how will he end? He will end in old age. Now don't ask me what old age is. I have no idea. I hear it's defined different ways by different people. You know, the older we get, it's funny how we... Look at old age. It's never us. (laughs) Now as we begin doing a deep dive, I've just given you an overview. That's it. Kind of showing you the, the personal touch of this psalm. This is David bearing his heart opening up his mind. But here is what makes this psalm so pertinent, so powerful. 
the very things that David declares are the same things that we as God's people should be declaring as well. This is not a foreign message. This is the message of every sheep in the shepherd's sheepfold. Remember, the psalmist says, we are the sheep of his pasture. And so when you think about the overview of Psalm 23, I like to think of it this way. David is going to move from life in the present to life in the presence. You get it? You see... We're in the present right now. Uh, but where is the focus of our faith? You know, that's the problem with too many of God's people. Uh, they've not learned to live beyond sea level. They're judging everything by what they see. Folks, through the eyes of faith, what do you see? You see life beyond the present to life one day in his presence. Now I want you to see how he begins this great personal testimony. He begins with this statement. And he begins where he needs to begin. He begins with the issue of relationship. This is where it all starts. It starts with having a relationship. Now, David, tell us about your relationship. David says, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Here it is. The Lord is, what's that next word? My. The Lord is my shepherd. David the king remembers the life of David the shepherd. And as David cared for his sheep, he ponders how the heavenly shepherd has been taking care of David, who is the sheep of the shepherd's fold. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, I want you to mark out two words in this statement. The first word is the word Lord. In the King James Version the word Lord is all in capital letters. That's very significant. And then the next word I want you to mark out is the word shepherd. The word shepherd. Lord is my shepherd. Let me put it a different way. David, you have a relationship to what person? David says, open up your eyes. I've just told you. I have a relationship to Jehovah Jesus. That's who he's describing. Jehovah Jesus. The word Lord, all in capital, in the Old Testament, is the designation of God's personal name, God's covenant-making, covenant-keeping name, Yahweh, or what we know, Jehovah. Jehovah. When you look in the Old Testament, you'll find that there are three main designations for the person of God. The first designation of God is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, Elohim. Elohim means that he is the mighty one, that he is the creator God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I am so amazed at people who weren't around when God did that work now tell us that God did not do that, that it just happened. You know it takes more faith to be stupid. It really does. I mean, honestly. Uh, I mean, you read the works of, of the evolutionist and, and, and really, you know, uh, no wonder they think that they come from monkeys because they're acting like monkeys. I mean, it's sad. It's sad. Educated idiots. 
I find it so much easier to believe the one who showed up at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I have no problem with that. And so the first designation for God is the word Elohim, the title Elohim. Now beyond Elohim, the next term um, is the word Adonai. Adonai. Now, how is the word Adonai marked out in the Old Testament? L, little o, little r, little d. See, that's the difference between how Jehovah, all capitals, and how Adonai, the two are distinguished. One is all in capitals, Jehovah. The other is capital L, then little O-R-D, that is Adonai. What does Adonai mean? It means Lord, Lord. And so for a great many centuries, God reveals himself as Elohim and as Adonai. But with the story of Moses, things begin to change. Remember Moses? He tries to do God's work his way. Didn't work out, did it? He kills an Egyptian. He ends up by having to run for his life. He spends the next 40 years as a shepherd out in the desert. And one day while he's tending the sheep, he, he sees something that, that catches his attention. He sees a bush that is burning but is not consumed. And, and he did the right thing. He said, you know, i got to go check this out. And so he does. And as he approaches this bush that's burning but is not being consumed, he hears a voice. Imagine a bush speaking to you. Moses! Not only did the bush speak to him, but the bush knew his name. Take off your shoes, for the ground upon which you stand is holy ground. He's having an encounter with God. But this is a God not designated by Elohim. This is not a God designated by Adonai. This is a God who's going to, for the very first time, communicate using his personal name, Yahweh Jehovah. Remember, Moses is going to ask, okay, when I go to the people, they're going to ask me, what God, what's the name of the God that has sent you to us? What do I say? And the answer is this, I am. I am that I am hath sent you. So, so David says, the Lord, the great I am. He's the one who is my shepherd. And as Moses hears this personal designation, the personal name of God, he realizes that what God is saying is simply this, I will be who I will be. I am the self-existing self one. Before there is anything, I am. I am the ever-present one. You know, we always try to think in our minds, when did God begin? Well, God had no beginning. God has no ending. You say, well, I don't think I can understand that. Good. <laughs> because if you could understand him, you wouldn't need him. Amen? Amen. If you get understanding, you be God. I like the mystery of Scripture. I don't find that unsettling. I find it amazing. I find it enticing. I find it exciting. And, and, and so as God is revealing himself to Moses, he is using his personal name, Jehovah, I am that I am. I will be who I will be. Now, David's take on this is that David really begins to understand the significance of 
I am, or I will be. David understands that God has said to him, I will be whatever you need me to be. Isn't that awesome? I will be whatever you need me to be. You're sick? I'll be the healer. You got a problem? I'll be the counselor. Whatever you need me to be, I will be. Isn't that comforting? To know that God can be whatever we need him to be. Now, it's interesting. When you look at Psalm 23, David designating his relationship that it is Jehovah, he uses throughout Psalm 23 nine Jehovah compounds. Nine Jehovah compounds. For example, when he talks about I shall not want, that's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He talks about Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Jehovah Shammah, my companion. Jehovah Nisa, my banner. So, no, David is giving testimony that whatever he needed God to be, God was. He was my shepherd. He was my provider. He was my peace, my healer, my righteousness, my companion, my banner, my sanctifier. He was my God. My God. So he uses that precious, precious title, the personal name of God. The Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. Now, understanding the significance of Jehovah, let's now understand the significance of shepherd. Turn, if you will, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Now, what is so amazing is that as God identifies himself to his people, he uses the image of the shepherd. And if you know anything about how shepherds were looked upon during the culture of that time, you'll find that they were not looked upon favorably. But... but Note, if you will, in John chapter 10, John chapter 10, look at verse 11. Now, this is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now look back to verses 1, 2, and 3 of that same chapter. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name. Now let's stop there for a moment. This is awesome. It is one thing for David to be able to declare, I know his name. But David can go one step further and declare something even greater. You say, what is that? David could declare, he knows my name. Yeah, I know his name, Jehovah, but he knows my name. Who knows your name, David? Jesus. Jehovah, Jesus. The all-powerful one. The all-compassionate one. He knows my name. 
There are a lot of people who claim to know him. The problem is he just don't know them. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Does he know your name? Does he know your name? Oh, we want to know his name, but we want to make certain that he knows our name. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus has sent out the 70. He's given them power to do ministry. They come back. They give a report. They are excited. And they begin to relate to Jesus what they have experienced. And they say to Jesus, even the demons, even the demons respond at the power of your name. And then he says something to them. It's almost like he's throwing cold water because he kind of changes the subject. Here they are giving this exciting report. And then Jesus says, listen, that, that, that's, that's good. The, the, the demons respond to the power of my name. But listen, rejoice in something greater. What do you mean rejoice in something greater? We just told you what's happening out there as we are ministering. No, rejoice in something greater. And what is that? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. In heaven. Jesus, the great I am, is our shepherd who knows our name. And he says the relationship is really quite simple. They hear my voice and they follow me. Do you hear his voice? And hearing his voice, do you follow him? See, that's the only thing that the sheep have to do. The sheep don't have to do a thing for the shepherd. Why? Because the shepherd takes care of the sheep. All he has to do is speak. And all we have to do is follow. Why do we mess it up? Why do we make it so hard? The sheep don't care what the shepherd's wearing. <laughs> the sheep really don't care where the shepherd's leading. The sheep just follow. I think one of the most simplistic but yet complex testimony of any man in the Bible is that of Enoch. You ever stop to think about what was the word on Enoch? What great thing did Enoch do? What important place did Enoch go to? Well, we don't know what he did. We don't know where he went, but we know one thing about Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Boy, doesn't that sound simple. But can I ask you a question? Have you tried it lately? <laughs> Not so easy. Amen? My sheep, they hear my voice and they follow me. I call them by name. So the shepherd knows his sheep by name. He knows my name. Why? Because my name has been written down in the lambs. Isn't that interesting? My shepherd is my lamb. And that's why my name is written in the lamb's book of life. You say, well, really, is that a big deal to have your name written in the Land's book of life. I don't know. You tell me. Look, if you will, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, let's see if it's a big deal to have your name written in the book of life. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in uh, verse 11. Verse 11. Remember, he says, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. 
David says, I know his name, but more importantly, he knows my name. Why? Because my name has been written down. You know the thing I like about my name being written down? It's not written down with pencil. Pencil can be erased. It's not written down by ink. Ink can be smudged. My name is written in the precious blood of Jesus. The blood that keeps on cleansing me from all my sin. The blood that never loses its power. My name, my name is on the book. Now, why am I thankful for that? Look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Is it important that your name is written in the book? Yeah. It most certainly is. Look, if you will, over to chapter 21. Verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You say, preacher, am I going to heaven? I don't know. Is your name written down? There's an old hymn that we used to sing. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. I know him by name. But more importantly, he knows me by name. There was a day that Jesus walked into a cemetery stood outside the grave of a man he loved greatly, a man who had been dead for four days, a man that everyone at that gathering knew was graveyard dead. But that's all right. Jesus knew his name. <laughs> Jesus knew his name. Lazarus, come forth. Good thing he only called Lazarus. Because <laughs> every name that he knew, had he called, they would have come forth. Amen. And one day he's going to say, David, come forth. Come up hither. Oh, I'm excited. The world's not falling to pieces. It's falling into place. Man, I tell you what, I am more in tune to the trumpet sound than I've ever been in all my life. I I, I do believe, I do believe with all my heart, if I get to experience the rapture, it won't be a toot of a horn that draws me forth. It'll be the note of my name. The note of my name. My name is what he knows. I like what Job had to say. He said, Thou would appoint me a set time and remember me. I like that. (laughs) Job, in all that he went through, the thing that brought him assurance, peace, and comfort was the fact that he knew that God would remember him. I think sometimes we, we feel like God's forgotten us. We go through dark valleys. We face difficult circumstances. And we feel as though God has forgotten about us. But Job says, no, 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 no. 
he remembers me. And then he asks a question. He says, if a man dies, shall he live again? Man, that question is asked over and over and over. Matter of fact, I had it asked to me just yesterday. I did a funeral last night. It was an interesting funeral. But it was a, sh- it was a service where God really showed up. I'd never seen as much dreadlocks and piercings and tattoos as I saw last night. I kind of felt out of place, you know. The only tattoos I had to show were my freckles. <laughs> God made, by the way. But, uh, you know, talking about death. You know, when you don't know Jesus, you don't know anything. Really, seriously. And, and when you don't know Jesus, the most important thing that you need to know is the thing that you don't know. Time and time again, people ask me, where do you think mama or daddy or brother or sister or friend has gone? Well, I don't know. But I do know this. If they know Jesus, I know where they are. Wherever they're going, they're already there. You mark it down. Wherever they're going, they're already there. Your last breath on this side will be your first breath on the other side. Better make sure you're going to the right side. Amen? And so he asks the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? And, And then he gives this answer. He says, all the days of my appointed time. And we do live by appointment. And we will die by appointment. Man, if I die and someone says, preacher had an accident, don't believe it. No, the preacher had an appointment. And so he says, all the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change come. And then this is the great note. This is the great note of victory that Job Sounds. He says this. Thou shalt call. And I will answer thee. <laughs> Don't you love that? One day when my appointed time. My allotted time. Has come. Thou shalt call. And it won't be. Hey you. It'll be my name that I hear. And when he calls, I will answer. I will answer. Because when he calls, he's going to call my name. Why? Because Jehovah Jesus is my shepherd too. Is he yours? with their heads bowed or eyes closed for just a moment. Oh, what a note of victory. What joy. What peace. What glory. The Lord is my shepherd. That's relationship. Oh, when are we going to understand that God is not interested in your religion? He's interested in one thing, a personal relationship. Do you have that personal relationship? Can you say with David, the Lord is my shepherd? You say, preacher, I'd love to have that kind of relationship. How can I get it? Are you ready? Ask for it. (laughs) Ask for it. For with a Heart, man believes. With the mouth, man confesses. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But religion gets in the way. We walk around in our back pocket with our list of do's and our list of don'ts. We try to measure our self-righteousness. And God's not looking at your righteousness. He's looking for a righteousness that comes from the Lamb. The Lamb who shed His precious blood providing what you need more than anything 
and that is the forgiveness of sins. Oh, we love to tell people, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And that is so true. But there is not a person in hell at this very moment that could not say that God did not love them. Why are they there if God loved them? They're there because they did not receive from the God of love their greatest need. And that was the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of sin. You must repent. You must have your sins forgiven. You must come to the cross. If you're not willing to meet God at Jesus at Calvary, you will not meet God at his house in glory. So with heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to join a religion. I'm asking you if you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, forgive you of your sin, and to make you his child. Would you do that right now? Would you do that? Would you pray something like this, dear Lord Jesus? Oh, I do believe, I do believe that when you died, you died for me. That you made possible the forgiveness of my sin in the precious blood of Jesus. Forgive me, I pray. Come into my life. Make me your child. For I want to have that kind of relationship that David had. I want to be able to say, today the Lord is my shepherd. I want to pause for just a moment. I hope you prayed that prayer if you needed to today. Oh, please do not walk out of this building not settling this issue once and for all. But maybe you're here this morning and he is your shepherd, but you become a stinking sheep. You become obstinate, hard-headed. One of the things that plague sheep is this. They wander. They wander. I think about how many of God's sheep have wandered away. No longer in the house of God on the Lord's day. No longer serving Him like they once did. No longer following Him like they once did. Oh, wandering sheep. Wandering sheep. Come back home. Come back home. Come back home. Wherever you are, I guarantee you, the shepherd will find you. Your life will be miserable. But you can always come back home. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. It's personal. There's no such thing as corporate salvation. For he alone is the Savior. Amen.